This is a 15th century salad. And this is a buchan. I'm fine. Can swords cut through armor? No, they can't, or can they? Basically, no. So the main reason I'm making this video is the other day I made a video about this amazing Chinese sword. Okay, this is the Liao Dao, um, and it's an amazing weapon, which is probably, in my opinion, specialized for fighting in armor. Within the Lao Dynasty, uh, so contemporary with the Song Dynasty context, okay, so we're probably talking primarily about lamellar armour here, but that doesn't mean that you should imagine that this is literally for carving through armour. The fact is that this blade is made of steel, and certainly steel armour is also made of steel. So when I talk about certain weapons that are specialised for fighting in armour, there's a couple of elements of that to unpack. First of all, there are certain weapons which make sense to use when you are yourself wearing armour. OK, so uh, because you don't have to necessarily carry a shield because you're better protected, uh, because you're more invulnerable to things like spears, blah, blah, blah. The fact is that you can get in close with your enemy more safely because you are wearing armour. Now, because that enables you to do that and because it's advantageous for you to do that against someone like a spearman or a pikeman or a halberdier, because it makes sense for you to get in close with them and fight at your best fighting range, that means that there are certain weapons like this or pole axes or swords, for example, which makes sense for you to use against those other opponents who aren't so well armoured. So in other words, the armour enables you to come to a distance where these weapons, which might not be so good in defence, you know, then you're not using a shield or you don't have a very long reach, Nevertheless, they make sense to use for you because they make you more effective as a fighter. Now, the secondary part to saying that these are better weapons for fighting in armour is the fact that they might be more effective against armour. So you have to accept that typical weapons, a normal one-handed sword, a normal spear, basically are nullified, are not cancelled out entirely, but they're made much, much less effective by armour. OK, it should be obvious. That's what armour's for. Remember that armour's hugely expensive and technologically advanced, depending on the type of armour, to make. So the fact that there was this huge investment in types of armour all the way back to the ancient world and all the way up to the Renaissance and in fact World War One, even World War Two in some cases, because there was a huge amount of investment in armour, it should be obvious that armour was important. Obviously in a World War Two context we're talking about tanks. <laughs> but um, a weapon like this, the Polax, is specialised for fighting in armour, but it fulfils both of those criteria. Number one, yes, it does make sense if you are a fully armoured man-at-arms, aka knight, to use a weapon like this, because the armour means you don't need to use a shield, so you therefore may as well maximise your offensive uh, capabilities with the weapon you use. It might be a bit heavier, it might be a bit slower, it will require two hands, but additionally, you don't need the long reach, you don't need the hand protection, blah blah blah, of certain other types of weapons which make sense in an unarmoured context. Okay, so yes, absolutely, weapons like the Polaks, or to come back to the Liao Dao, are, uh, do make a lot of sense in an armoured context. They make sense for the armoured person to use, but the secondary thing is, yes, they make uh, sense to use against the armoured person as well, because they are more potent, OK? Now, what do we mean by that? That's a little bit complicated, because if you can't cut through most types of armour, whether it's mail or lamellar or plate, if you can't cut through it, then how do these weapons become more potent? Well, fundamentally, there are a number of ways, but the most obvious way is they hit harder, OK? So despite the fact that this is very well edged and very sharp, and if you uh, chopped a large beast with this, it would cleave through it incredibly effectively, if you hit this helmet with this blade, the blade isn't going to cut through the helmet and chop my head in half. It's not going to happen. This helmet will do its job. It's hardened carbon steel. It's made of the same material as this blade. Admittedly, some types of armour, you know, you might have an iron helmet, which might be compromised more by a hard steel blade, may or may not. Bear in mind, modern steel is, generally speaking, tougher than historical steel. But uh, there are certain types of helmet might be made of organic materials, they might be made of uh, leather and um, horn and things like this. And indeed, you might be able to compromise those. And in fact, there was, uh, in Japan, 
They did go in for Kabuto or helmet chopping <laughs> competitions. And this is, uh, you know, they were using iron and they were made of a series of plates which were riveted together. So you can compromise them in a way. And yes, you can in some terms literally cut through a piece of iron with a piece of steel. So much so that in the 19th century, certain types of German saber are marked Eisenhower, which means iron cutter. But bear in mind what they're cutting is an iron nail or wire. So it's a thin piece of iron being cut by a hard steel blade. So yes, you can shear or cut iron if it's thin enough. However, a helmet, for the most part, you're not going to be able to cut through. Right, let's just dispense with this helmet for a second. Um, the, the thing that you do have to bear in mind is these weapons are going to hit harder. Okay, so because they hit harder, they're going to have a percussive effect. Oh, this is a bit of a, there's a, there you go, there's a micro test and how easy is it to get a helmet off while holding a two-handed weapon. Not very easy at all. Um, but the yes indeed they're going to have a, a larger percussive effect so yes they're just going to hit the person harder and we know that this was done in armor we know even from modern sporting uh, combat sports like uh, bohurt um, hmb type stuff we know that just hitting people in armor has an effect on them it's fatiguing it's concussing sometimes you can break bones blah 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 so if you have a weapon that is now a bit heavier and two-handed even though it's got a sharp edge and yet that person over there is an archer thunk you can take them in half with it but this person over here is a knight if you smash them in the head yes it's going to have a percussive effect on them obviously it's going to have potentially hurt their neck it's going to daze them it might even concuss them it might even knock them out in some rare cases with particularly top heavy weapons like halberds and pole axes you might even just kill them with a blow to the head without actually compromising the helmet so yes it has a percussive effect but secondly these also have points. Now the points against armor, you're gonna be going for gaps. Sometimes you might hit the breastplate or lamella or mail or whatever, and it might just knock the person back. And then you might follow up with a smack to the head or whatever, or the leg or the knee or that kind of stuff, take a blow to the knee. Um, but the thrust into the armpit or the face, if the face is open, or indeed into the groin, these are all things which are more easily done with a two-handed weapon with both hands manipulating the weapon and having the leverage to encounter, encounter the opponent's attacks and weapon while still keeping your point online and getting it where it needs to go. This is the whole point to half-sorting with long swords. So, um, these sorts of weapons, fundamentally, for most of the time, can't in realistic terms cut through armour, certainly not armour like this. But, they can bypass it more easily, they can have a percussive effect on it more easily, they can get the point on more easily, and the final thing I want to think, you to think about is these sorts of weapons, because they're beefy and two-handed and you've got a gap between the hands, also make sense in a close-in grappling situation as well. Um, we see this in the Polak treatises of the 15th and 16th centuries, like uh, Le Jus de la Hache and the anonymous Bolognese sauce. If someone comes in close, yes, you've got back end, just as you do with a sword, but you've also got the middle here and you've got a huge amount of leverage. So if someone grabs your weapon, you've got a huge amount of uh, leverage to get them off it and bring your weapon back into play. If someone comes in close, with pole axes or any other weapon, because you've got your hands far apart here, here in a big lever, you've got the ability to hook around bits of them, to lever them, to throw them across the neck or around the knee, pull and push as well, and barge them away with the middle, um, the shaft of the weapon as well, which goes for the Liao Dao. So, to summarize, for a whole bunch of reasons, these weapons make sense for fighting in armor and against armor. So if you're wearing armor, they make sense, but equally if you're fighting other people in armor, they make sense as well for all of the aforementioned reasons. But when I say that they're effective for fighting in armor, don't immediately think that I mean that these can cleave through armor. For most of the time, 99% of the times, they cannot cut through armor. But that doesn't stop them from still being incredibly effective against armor. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope I'll see you soon on the channel. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.